characters stand inside. We're actually doing Lord of the Rings. Directors and tiny houses, tiny houses. Houses, remodeling houses. Um, basically. It's not a rather something that other people call you. I don't call myself a cover. As everyone. I am Atish Sharma, senior editor at Home Crux magazine. We've been covering design and architecture for a decade and have interviewed many eminent personalities, including the likes of Pritzer Price director, Salon Del Mobile president, and many London-based uh, designers uh, okay. with prominent names like Barbara Roschobi, who I personally call the design darlings of London. And it is indeed a great pleasure. I, to will, I will tease Price them about that. <laughs> Oh, yes, indeed. I believe that. So I'd, I'd begin. Tell us a little about yourself. And when I say a little about yourself, I want to know where were you born? How was your childhood like? And where did you derive this whole affinity for design? OK, uh, I was born in London. Um, perhaps unusually these days, I was born in the centre of London and I've lived in London all my life. So I'm a proper Londoner. And... You know, London is a very international city and when you go out to kind of dinner parties and things like that, I'm often one of two people, perhaps, who were born and bred in London. Um, you know, so it's a lot of international people and a lot of people from around the UK have moved to London. So it it's changed quite a lot in my, in my kind of life, lifetime. And... Um, but London is still quite kind of territorial. You know, it's a big city and I'm a dedicated North Londoner. So I've, I've lived about a mile and a half from where I grew up. So I hope it doesn't mean I'm stuck in my ways, but I haven't gone very far. <laughs> so, um, and that sense of place, I think has been kind of quite important. Um, and um, my interest in design started in my early teens. And there are two stories I can tell you, which kind of, when you're at that age, when you're starting to think about what you want to do with your life and what you're interested in, sometimes it's just one or two moments that give you um, a perspective and, and, and an enthusiasm for something. And... Uh, the, the, my mother told me I'm going, she was going to take me to, I was about 14 or 15, take me to a lecture. And I thought, oh, God, a lecture, that sounds really boring. I don't want to go to that. I want to watch my favourite programme on TV, you know. And anyway, she dragged me to this lecture. And the lecture was Richard Rogers, the architect, talking about the Pompidou Centre, um, which had been newly built in Paris, and I sat there looking at him, thinking, wow, he's quite cool. And the building was amazing. I think it's one of the most important buildings of the latter half of the 20th century, you know, and spawned a whole uh, array, array of new architecture. But for me, it was a formative experience because I developed an interest initially in architecture and then, and then from that design. And... You know, started to buy books and read about it. Um, one of the books I was in, once my family heard I was interested in this, this became Christmas presents and things, and one of the initial books I was given was by the great art and design historian, architectural historian, Nicholas Pesner. And the book was called Pioneers of Modern Design, and I was particularly interested in 20th century early modernity. And I devoured this book and went to school after the holidays. And there was a boy in my class who was called, surname was Pesner, which is quite an unusual surname. So I said to him, I got given his book by this guy called Nicholas Pesner. He said, oh, he's my grandfather. Would you, would you like to meet him? So I said, uh, okay. So I went and had tea with Nicholas Pesner, who was probably in the last years of his life at his house in Hampstead in North London, who was so sweet and charming and was really pleased that I'd read his book and wanted to know what I thought and was just an enthusiast for the subject. So 
These two experiences, one by one of the kind of leading practitioners of our generation, and two, the, the most eminent of the architecture and design historians of that period, I was very fortunate to have that exposure to both of them. And it gave me that lifelong interest in architecture and design. And from here onwards, you went on to found the London Design Festival. How has the event evolved over the years and what's the story behind the London Design Festival? How did it all start? Well, hang on, there's, there's more to say before we get to that. Yeah, sure. Because I went to university to study architecture originally, realised it was the history of it that interested me more, went to the Royal College of Art where I did history of design, um, which was in those days the only academic subject at the college. And um, from then, I found myself writing policy for the, the Labour Party, who was then in opposition. And I researched and drafted their first um, design policy, and which came out in the early 90s, before the 1992 election. So it evolved very, very quickly into um, a, a more of a, a professional career. I graduated from my master's degree in 89, and went straight into 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 policy, but also in to to teaching. So I had this kind of long journey um, through the nineties, which was a uh, a lot of policy work and a lot of teaching, into doing the Millennium Dome. I was one of the editors of that project, which was a very challenging role to play. And then coming out of the other side of that, looking for something to do. Uh, I met with John, who was my co-founder, yes. and we decided that London needed a moment in the year to celebrate design. And the reason for that is um, we're kind of culturally and creatively spoiled in London. There's too much stuff, and you can't possibly see or experience it all. Um, and it may, makes kind of... The, 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 the landscape quite congested. And the model, which is now adopted by many people all over the world, is that you find a time in the year where you dedicate the city as best as you can to the subject. And, um, you know, we kicked off the, the festival in 2003, which was the first edition. And it, um, and the other thing that London has, which is, again, unusual for many cities, it's got kind of breadth and depth. And what I mean by that is it's got excellence in probably, I don't know, 15 to 20 different design disciplines because the, the, the subject of design or the sector of design is, is much, much bigger than you might imagine. And um, often cities have excellence in two, three, four. London has excellence in... 15 plus. Um, so we we wanted to celebrate that kind of diversity in design and uh, launched in 2003. It was very modest at the beginning. We were an unknown quantity at that point. Sometimes we had to literally beg people to do stuff. Um, we had 35 projects in the first year. Within four years, we had 300. Um, so it reached a maturity very, very quickly, which said to us there were, it was a kind of right moment and there was a kind of untapped demand for a kind of celebratory and promotional moment for, for design in the city. <laughs> we elected to do an event which was citywide. Um, that it has its positives, but also has its challenges. You know, because the city is geographically big, how do you make sense of that? And, and in the early years, we would have didn't have the same kind of coordination that we have today. You know, there would be let's say three things you wanted to see on the same evening, and they would be opposite sides of the city. So you would spend more time travelling than you would seeing seeing the kind of projects. So it became clear that if we could create kind of clusters of 
of design activity in, in different areas, which were walkable, was all walkable, then that would help our audience get to see as much as possible. So the, you know, the festival has kind of evolved and changed from the early years. It reached a critical mass very, very quickly. Uh, and it became, and, and remember in those days, there were, I think, four, five, six global cities doing design promotional activity. A lot, I think we we're at around 200 now. So it's been a kind of global explosion where any city welfare socks um, feels the need to um, celebrate and promote its, its design activity. It's a very kind of positive message to, to, to say about um, the city where, to where you live. And um, I'd like to think that London has retained its position you know, at near the top of this. Um, and we had some very helpful kind of inbuilt structural advantages. I've talked about one already, which is uh, the kind of breadth and depth argument. Um, uh, I've alluded to another, which is the internationalism of the city for a very long time. I mean, for over decades, we enjoyed a migration of talent to London. And, you know, many of our design superstars um, don't or didn't have British passports. You know, they they were attracted to either come to be educated, because, of course, we had a strong um, design education system, but or to 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 live and work. Um, and so we benefited kind of hugely from that. And indeed, a city which has a very kind of established international media. So the story we were telling I think this is a very important point. We are storytellers. Yes. And every project we do, an event as a whole, is a story which hopefully refreshes itself the whole time about design. And, you know, we started then adding more layers to what we did. And we're an open platform on which um, anyone can, can participate. And, um, and they are, you know, governments... They are tiny studios of two people doing a graphics project, department stores, you know, um, major um, brands, uh, uh, design schools. I mean, everything you can imagine. And but I think it's quite important to articulate the, the, the differences between them. But we started doing a series of kind of bespoke projects, which were all attempts to present uh, a story about design in a different way, often in a very, very public place. And these commission projects have become a very important part of our program and have helped us, to be honest, build a, a kind of global reputation. So it's, it's enabled us to, to work with some of the world's best kind of architects and designers. And I think we've done about 150 of them now, these projects. And um, hopefully you're familiar with some of them. And um, we've had a residency in the V&A. We've taken over St. Paul's Cathedral. Um, we've used Trafalgar Square. You know, we've done them everywhere. And um, we think that our audiences is, is multifold. There is a dedicated design audience who will go anywhere to, to see anything you do, which is great. But there's a, arguably a more important audience, which is kind of everyone else. And, you know, in particular, the kind of passerby. And I, I still get a thrill from doing a project somewhere public and someone who's never heard of a London Design Festival comes across it and thinks, wow, what's this? What's this about? And if I could tell you one little story, we did a project sure. in Trafalgar uh, Square a few years ago with Ez Devlin. Um, and I hope you, you're aware of Ez's work. And she does stuff, she's got a background in kind of stage design and theatre, but does much, much more than that these days. And we worked with Google Arts and Culture and utilised some of their new technologies. And the idea was to put a fifth lion at the base of Nelson's column, and which was an exact replica of the other lions. We 3D scanned one of the lions 
um, put put it in, um, and the only difference was it was painted fluoro red. So it was very, very noticeable. The rest of them, it's all black and granite and grey, yes. you know, and so on. And you could feed the lion a word, and the machine learning technology that Google provided would turn that word into a line of poetry, which we then projected up Nelson's column. And about a year later, I got into a taxi, and the, the cabbie, the driver, was very chatty. What do you do design? He said, you didn't do that lion, did you, in Trafalgar Square? I thought, wow, how did he make that connection? <laughs> how did he even, you know, he, and he remembered it. You know, and he, he must have just driven past a couple of yes. times, you know. And that is a very kind of uh, apocryphal story in a way because it, it it illustrates that you can reach and uh, actually everyone is interested in design. You know, we all consume it all day, every day. We don't really think about it. But if we can create moments where we can stop, get people to stop and pause and think and remember, then we've really achieved something. And um, every one of those 150 projects all different from each other. But the, 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 the thread that runs through them all is design. Yes. And, um, you know, it's almost like a kind of mission to, uh, you know, because I do genuinely believe we're all interested in it and we just have to be reminded about it occasionally, um, to, you know, create a kind of storybook. Um, and we've, in fact, we did a, um, if ever you come to London, I'll give you one. We did a uh, uh, anniversary book on our 20th anniversary in, a couple of years ago. And it was very, very nice trying to lay out. And we chose 60 of the projects we'd done at that point. And it was a very helpful kind of illustration and reminder to us about the kind of range of things we've done and how kind of remarkable some of them were because they were super ambitious, you know, sometimes arguably unbuildable. And each time we would kind of overcome these challenges and kind of find a way of doing it. But you know, picking up on my audience point, these projects have, you know, in total have been seen by millions and millions of people directly and then indirectly by tens, if not hundreds of millions of people um, because of the kind of power of media and in these days social media. Um, so I think that's a very kind of important part of, what we're trying to do. So I'll stop talking. I've been going on a lot. Probably got more questions. Yes. So, you know, after these many years, what role what role do you see design playing in shaping the cultural experiences and fostering innovation within cities? Well, I mean, I think, you know, the, the we we urbanized as a country many years ago, but that process is still ongoing. Yes. And, you know, the majority of the world lives in cities these days. Um, and um, the kind of urban experience is, is very, very important. And it can be very challenging at times, um, but it it can be very rewarding at the same at, at the same time. So, you know, it's about offering those rewards and you know, making our civilised life as, as interesting and, and, and exciting as possible. But it's also increasingly about... So, for example, another big dynamic that is happening is in the UK, and I think in many other countries, we've passed peak car ownership. And, you know, I've got four kids now in their 20s and 30s, and two of them have not bothered to get their driving licence. And because they do not see that as a kind of essential part of growing up and being an adult. And for my generation, literally the first thing you did when you were like 18 was pass your driving test. Yes. So that you could, because the mobility that a car gave you was just a kind of essential part of your independence. And that has changed considerably. And I can remember as a child, not many cars parked on our street and we've gone to impossible to find a place to park your car on the street back to more and more spaces on the street um but if you think about how you know our 
living experience, it is dominated by the need, your urban mobility and, and essentially the private car. And um, what you're now seeing in London is things like, which are quite kind of controversial, uh, low traffic neighbourhoods, which are about restriction of movements and some areas you can't even go into unless you live there. And um, out of which there's been streets that have been closed and blocked and pedestrianised and we're seeing it more and more and more and landscaped. So they're like these little kind of oases that are emerging in, in, in the city and changing our kind of sense of place and, 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 and belonging. Now, cars are going to be increasingly, you know, continue, sorry, to be, to be part, of, part of our lives. But, you know, when we're going to a model where more likely you're going to share one rather than own one. Um, you know, we've got, I've got outside my house a kind of car scheme, which gets used all the time. You know, and in the area I live, own, you know, only a third of residents own a car. And so that is, um, and, you know, and of course we've got electrification, which is not just about um, improving pollution levels within the city, but it's about noise levels as well. You know, because the biggest noise that we experience is the combustion engine. Yes. And um, what role can design play in these in these quite, I think, kind of dramatic changes? So we're interested in that. And when those kind of spaces and opportunities emerge, what can we do to kind of enhance that environment? We're also interested in, uh, which is a very kind of developer term, placemaking where you try to create something, you know, because the more interesting city is a distinctive city. And I don't know where you live, there are probably local landmarks or buildings or facilities and amenities that help you frame what you consider to be your neighbourhood. And they're increasingly important. We can use design to add to that list rather than kind of subtract to it. So, in fact, many of the more interesting projects we've done have been very much about um, helping to give new areas um, some greater sense of kind of distinctiveness and and identity. So there's all of that side of things. The other um, big area is through kind of technology. And I think there is a growing relationship between design and and technology i was actually coming to this question i was coming to this question how has oh, technology okay. <laughs> influenced the design landscape so i said it again please how has technology influenced the design landscape oh it, it's more and more and more so we've got a more fertile relationship with technology and 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 design so you know technology i think we're moving into the next phase and, you know, so, for example, we've done a, our first couple of projects with augmented reality. And we did a project with uh, Su Fujimoto, who's a Japanese architect, um, where he wanted to explore the relationship between nature and architecture, but, but experience through a new technology. So our audience wore glasses, not VR glasses, but kind of what they call mixed reality glasses. Mixed reality. And so you could see the environment you're in, but you also saw something augmented. And if you could imagine you're seeing the Northern Lights and the Northern Lights um, descending like walls of light to, to the ground, which then became kind of metaphors for the architecture you were in, um, that was the project. And, you know, we did that in the VNA, which is our, one of the most important museums for design and decorative arts. And it was a kind of early experiment in something that is going to become very, very familiar for all of us. And, you know, the technology companies are bringing out, I, mean, I think Apple are about to do this now, aren't they? They announced it last year, the year before, um, the, the glasses where, you know, you can be at home and you'll have a whole library to choose from and you know you can watch your favorite band play on your dining room table <laughs> um and um design is the kind of lens through which that technology is 
it is understood and 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 in, interpreted. I mean, I don't know if you know, but IBM are getting closer and closer to a functioning quantum computer. I've heard of it. And, yeah, and this quantum computer has a has a computing which is unfavorable. I mean, it, it can basically go back to the beginning of time. You know, it can do everything. Yes. <laughs> but what does it look like? You know, how do you how do you you know what what is your kind of notion and understanding of a quantum computer? So you you mentioned Barbaroscopy, one of their other companies, because the Barbaroscopy bit is a furniture and product design bit. But uh, Ed and Jay, who founded the company, also have a another company which works uh, very closely with IBM to try and design the future quantum com computer. So I think that, you know, I've just given you a couple of illustrations, but I think that that interface is is going to be increasingly important. Uh, you know, you've got um, Facebook now, now Meta, who talk about something very, very abstract called the metaverse. And I think their audi audiences are not very clear quite what that is. Um, and indeed, I think a lot of their own employees don't quite know what it is. Um, so it's a very kind of bold and brave step into something that uh, Zuckerberg is actually convinced is, 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 is the future. But again, I think design is the kind of lens by which you can understand and uh, um, and 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 use that 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 te that technology. So I think that's that's kind of increasingly important. Um, if I could just talk about a couple of other little areas briefly, and this may be also, but we've we've um, moved into a very kind of sustainable realm. Yes, and, and that's, that is that is what my actual next question was. You know, sustainability, oh, okay. <laughs> sustainability is a critical aspect of design today. And what I wanted to ask you is that how does the festival, how does a festival like London Design Festival or Paris Design Week promote a sustainable practice and inspire a design community to prioritize environmental considerations? Well, I think to, they were doing it to some extent already. And I think we've seen in the last, it's not been that, that long, but let's say, you know, five, six, seven years, um, other than a few kind of um, pioneers, we've seen a shift um, by, in design practice and, and indeed from design consumers towards a kind of more sustainable approach. Now, um, I, I mentioned the commission projects that we do. So we might do, I don't know, five, six, seven, eight projects in a year. And there was a point where we might do one or two that with a sustainable um, angle to them, it's all of them now have a, a, a sustainable dimension, either through their materiality or through the kind of fabrication process, certainly in terms of its legacy. We don't trash them after, you know, we, we, we find kind of second homes for everything. But, um, you know, we're trying to, kind of tell that story every time we we put a new design story out you know and that's become the norm and that happened quite quickly um we're working with an organization called sap um you've probably used them without realizing in that they are the world's preeminent system software designers so when you buy a railway ticket or you buy a pair of shoes or, you know, almost anything you consume, there is a system that has enabled you to get the right size pair of shoes, you know, and, and so on. And they collect their, they're a German company, but they work with everyone in terms of the global brands. And um, they claim that 75% of the world's transactions they've got an, an involvement in. I mean, that's incredible if that's the case, you know. Um, and we have been working with them on a um, program about trying to, in fact, it's a campaign to try and get the global design community to adopt the principles of circularity in their working practice. 
And the way that we've been doing that, we also do something called the Global Design Forum, um, which one day I'd like to bring to India, by the way. Um, but that's another, another story. Uh, we're now doing that in New York. I think we're going to do it in China later this year. And within that, and SAP are the principal supporter of it, we try and tell a series of stories and illustrations of best practice, um, generate kind of debate and discussion around, around circularity. And what you're seeing, um, you know, in terms of, I mean, you you know there was a big report that came out about concrete a few years ago, which has kind of sent shockwaves around the world. Because concrete, um, we all knew this, but hadn't had it kind of mapped out for us, is a highly polluting material. Yes. In it, in its, in its um, creation and in, and in its disposal. I mean, when it's there, it's kind of okay. Um, and you know. The construction industry is not going to overnight stop using concrete, but what it has prompted, and we're getting closer and closer to this, is actually a sustainable co concrete product. So we're seeing a lot of kind of material innovation and a lot of soul searching from architects and designers trying to find alternative ways to do stuff. Um, we also are working with an American Timber Association and um all of their wood is sustainably sourced um but every time we do something with them and we've worked with them eight nine ten times um we're trying to tell an, a sustainable backstory to 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 the project and you know one of the trends that we're now seeing is about uh reuse of materials you know in in particular in kind of architecture what can you salvage you know, if you have to demolish the building, what can you salvage from that demolition and kind of re reuse it in the replacing building? Um, you know, we've done a couple of projects on, um, we did one interesting one with uh, Singapore Design Association, where there was about um, repair to, to products and actually repairing something, not back to exactly where it was, but the repair adding a new layer of design to to the 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 product or the or the item, and I think that's quite an interesting idea. To you know, as part of the 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 lifespan of it, um, you you get it repaired and it comes back evolved and changed and different, but still working. Um, so there's a, all of those kind of thoughts and energies and and activities, and again, I come back to my point earlier. We're an open platform under which all of these stories can be told. Yes. But we have a responsibility to try and ensure that um, as many of those 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 important changes are being told. And you know, you're the brain behind the London Design Biennale as well. To someone who's not familiar with the automatics of design, how would you explain London Design Biennale to him? Well, I've always been rather fascinated by expos and kind of national and international kind of showcases. And I've been a regular visitor to Venice where there's been an architecture binale for yes. um, longer, longer than I've been around. And um, what we realized, one, was that there wasn't a global binale for design. And remember, at the heart of these events, it, it are showcases by countries. And so we are inviting the countries of the world to participate and respond to a theme set by an artistic director. Um, and it's in a single location in a building called Somerset House in central London. Yes. And it is an opportunity for countries, and I don't know if you've been to expos and, and those kinds of events, but I think, you know, when it works you can come away with a different view of, of perception of, of what the, one of the countries that you've been, been looking at. And I think we tend to have very kind of fixed and somewhat stereotypical views of other places, which have been framed by all the kind of inputs that you've soaked up over, over the years about those places. You know, and I, I think you, you, 
you, you get my story that we can think designed to be a very kind of dynamic and kind of changing discipline. And, it, it, you know, what countries can do by telling a new story about themselves through, through the lens of design. So that's what the Biennale is, is all about, is all about. And, um, you know, we expect to have around 50 countries participating. The next one will be in, in June 25. Um, very much hoping that India is there. I think they're going to be. Um, and uh, we're also hoping that we can, after the show in London, travel the show to uh, uh, another place. And that's something we're looking at at, at, at the moment. So the phenomenon of a design binani is a relatively new thing. We've only done four editions so far. Um, takes a bit longer. They're every two years, um, but they're on. It will be on for a month in London in in June twenty five, which is the, the the next edition. And um, if I can give you one example within that, um, we work with Ez Devlin, and I mentioned her earlier on the project in Trafalgar Square. Yes. Who, who was our artistic director. She came up with a theme of resonance. Um, and um, I think you can interpret that in many, many different ways. She provided the central installation for us. There is a big courtyard at the center of Somerset House, which has never ever, as far, as far as we know in its history, had any greenery in it. You know, it is a rather beautiful 18th century stone building with a central kind of courtyard. Of course, Ayres, in her provocative way, built a forest in that space. <laughs> and we had a 400 tree we, forest that we were able to place in there um, and keep alive um, and then donate to different two different areas of London where the trees are all being replanted. Um and it was a very kind of spectacular experience. And, and at the centre of this little forest was the UN's global sustainability goals. And the UN United Nations has 17 different goals, many of which are, are environmental. And we told the story of those goals at, at the, in the little kind of clearing in the wood, if you like, at, at, at the centre of, of that Biennale. But what it offered us also was a memorable and spectacular installation that helped to kind of plant the idea of a London Design Biennale in many more people's minds. Coming back to London Design Festival again, uh, do you see the London Design Festival surpassing the hype of Paris Design Week or Salon Del Mobile for that matter, or has it already? Well, I think of the, of the cities doing um, design promotion, I would say that London and Milan are at the top. Yes. Um, I think there's critical differences between London and Milan, and we're often compared, but I think it's very hard to compare us in that um, what you get in Milan in the Saloni each April is a gathering of the world's furniture industry. And if you go to the fair... The contemporary halls are just one part of uh, a much, much bigger uh, selling show. And so, for example, you'll have whole halls full of um, modern antique furniture. And, you know, th 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 they don't get any headlines, but it is a massive part of the, the, the industry. Um, in the centre of the city, you're getting similar kind of stuff that we're doing in London, where different um, designers are trying to tell a story, often in partnership with a brand of one sort or another. Um, and Milan, of course, is a smaller city geographically than, than, than London. And you can achieve a kind of greater sense of kind of takeover and concentration there. And it is a kind of must-see for everyone. We all go. Um, but likewise, they come to us. And um, what happens in Milan, I think, is primarily about launching products and selling. And we do that too, but I'd like to think we're also about expression of ideas. And we have many shows that are not for sale, 
but I just trying to say something in, 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 instead. Now it might it might evolve to a product for sale. Uh, can I give an example of that? So a couple of years ago, we sure. did a project with Sony Design, and who've just I think celebrated a 60th, 60th anniversary. There must be one of the first global brands with uh, you know with such a kind of strong design ethos as part of what they do. Outside Japan, their biggest design lab, I think they or center, is is here in the UK. And unusually, I think for many brands these days, they have a genuine R and D department. And in that R and D department, the designers there are allowed to play and experiment with their technologies and um, design, offering a series of kind of design experiences. So the project that they, you know, and some point down the road that that might lead to a product, but it's not it's not a necessity. You know, it's a happy happy outcome if it does, but they don't mind if if ideas are just uh, are are uh, an idea for ideas' sake. Um, the project they did with us is they've managed on their uh, imagery technology or TV technology to get clarity down to a single pixel. You know, and that's been a kind of holy grail for a long, long yes. time. On, on, you know, they've so been the exhibiting it at Consumer Electronics Show as well. Yeah, exactly. So the definition you can now get on your HD TV is incredible. Yes, I mean it, it, you can't really go any further than that. I mean it, that's that's absolute kind of clarity. Now. That hasn't yet um, um, transformed into a viable consumer product, um, but they wanted to tell that story with us. So they created an experience where you as a visitor could come and you'd interact with this screen, and there were a whole series of different uh, journeys and scenarios that you, you entered in just through your presence in front of this screen. And and it was all about that the clarity on that on that single pixel. So and they chose to do that in London, not not kind of elsewhere. So that for us helps to increase this this uh, reputation as a place where ideas are are expressed. And remember, the value is in that design creation. And you know, the example that everyone gives, and it's a bit tired, but I'll give it to you again. You know, on the back of your iPhone, if you have one, it says designed in California, assembled in China. Yes. It doesn't even say made in China. It says in assembled. China. Assembled in China, yeah. Yeah. And, you know, what that is saying is the important bit in the process is where the idea comes from and where it's designed. And, you know, somewhere else in the world can put the pieces together. Um, and that, I think, is quite an important reminder about you know the role design is kind of having in our kind of collective futures you know and i think and we've expressed this a couple of times through various things we've been doing the design designers are the problem solvers of the 21st century you know arguably this this innovation and, and creative endeavor can sort anything <laughs> and i think we've got a global design community a geared up to take on these, these, these big problems in partnership with uh, technology through the lens of sustainability, thinking about our kind of well-being and health, you know, and those are all the, the, the kind of big drivers in design today. The next thing I'd like to ask you is that what are the aspirations for the future of London Design Festival and any specific plan that you'd like to disclose to home trucks audience, what can we expect from this year's London Design Fest? Well, I think I've, I've articulated some of them already, to be honest. Yes. Um, we um, remember it's, it's primarily to a London audience. We're trying to make it uh, consumable by global audiences. So we're carrying on working on, you know, in, improving the stories that uh, how we present the stories and and how people can access access those stories wherever they might be in 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 the world. Um, I think we're still on the journey 
of conversion and understanding. Um, and we want we want more and more people to um, be inspired by the, those those stories that we tell. Um, we're at an early stage of the year in our planning, um, but we've got some ambitious projects that we will be launching each September. But that's part of my cyclical cyclical life. We don't want to stand still as as an as an event. Um, we want to be different each year. So we're constantly trying to be aware of thinking and changes in behavior and innovations in, in, in technologies that, uh, that we can integrate in, in, into our daily lives. But I think one thing that's worth pointing out is, you know, we've got this kind of platform on which sits a lot of content. And what we've also got then is a hungry audience wanting to consume that content. Yes. And our job in a way is to introduce the two to each other. And I think our tendency is to go to experience things we already know about. But the most rewarding is to go to discover something new. Um, but they need our help to do that. And um, so get going to new areas seeing things in those areas from by um, people you've never heard of, um, being kind of brave in your in your choices and, and, and your consumption. So we're trying to kind of help our audience. And remember, we had, it's a big audience. I mean, last year we had 1.7 million visits over a nine-day period. How do we make those visits satisfying? And, we, and how, and I've talked about, you know, people remembering things afterwards. Um, think about all the things you do every day or all the things you do over a week or a month and so on. You know, most of them, you just forget about them. And why would you remember them? They're not, they're not good enough quality. They're not distinctive enough. They're not interesting enough. Um, I hope that we can give you each year uh, a new set of memories that you will take forward with you and they're important to you and you want to talk about them to, with other people. So we want to generate debate and discussion and interest and so on. So there's a kind of mission that perhaps will never end based on, based on that kind of um, mass consumption of, of, of design. So, for example, and I'll just mention this, we've been looking at doing a project around bread. Now you might think, what's that got to do with design? Well, there's a number of designers who now work with different foods and create absolutely wonderful kind of presentation installations through those. Yes. Um, we're interested in design because, sorry, sorry, in bread, because of its kind of daily consumption across all cultures. I mean, it's really hard to find a culture or a food type or a nationality where bread is not a daily consumption. Yes. Meanwhile, there's a food revolution going on in London. You know, we talked about it being a, one of the few genuinely global international cities. You can eat food from any country you like here. And that, I think, is a huge asset for the city. And we're in this kind of golden era. There's never been a better time to eat in London than now. And, um, but, you know, some of the range of those, those food offers and bread in particular, imagine you kind of map out the breads of the world and put them in, 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 in one place. Um, that makes quite an interesting story, but we want to design that. And so we're talking to a big bakery chain. We're talking to, and you can find people who are, kind of bread obsessives they're trying to p perfect the perfect chapati or the or the perfect sourdough or the per perfect baguette i mean literally that's all their focus is on life is trying trying to, to do that so we're trying to find all of those people and and to bring them to the front and and tell those stories so it, it is a kind of designed story about london's diversity um just using 
food, which we think is a, a creative endeavor, by the way, you know, the creative industries are a very kind of important part of the London economy. And uh, while not currently recognized, food or or the or, or the restaurant world is is a creative endeavor. And it's also part of us trying to do something different each year. Um, and I think if it pull, if it comes off, and we're hopeful that it will, it will be quite a spectacular project to to experience. Yes. Ben, in your opinion, what are the key challenges and opportunities facing the design industry today, and how can events like yours address them? Um, well, again, I've articulated some of those already. Um, I think uh, in a UK context, we've made, in my view, the wrong decision to leave the European Union and restrict the movement of talent within Europe. As I said earlier, we've enjoyed a kind of migration of the best of that talent yes. to London and the UK over many years. It's now much more difficult to do. And it might mean that the pendulum will swing and the centers of excellence will grow in, in other places to our detriment. Um, so the, the how one finds talent uh, in design is really important, but it, it can be grown domestically. And so I ended up getting involved in some of these discussions. We've got an election probably later this year. Um, what's interesting is um, after decades of trying, our political parties seem to understand now that design and the creative industries is actually pretty important. Um, you know, what we've been aided for is incredible economic data on it. Um, and it's a bigger sector after financial services um, and employs millions of people. You know, as I said, I think I mentioned earlier, it's, it's in one in six of every job in, in London. And um, we need to feed, feed that industry. And that means we need to educate people um, and get people doing creative creative subjects at school which which stimulates their interest and and uh, you can have a successful career in 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 that sector so we we are involved in or I, I am involved perhaps in some of those debates and 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 discussions as well about how we can maintain what has proved to be a super successful industry um and, uh, you know, if I go back to my point earlier about how every city in the world now appears to want to have a design showcase in, it, it's because their city governments and their national governments are understanding that too. You know, your su successful uh, labour market is people who have skills, people who have ideas, and people who can um, interpret and transform those, th th those ideas. Um, so I think, you know, design is, is at the forefront of that and is part of quite a, quite a significant kind of global change in, in innovation and skills and, and, uh, you know, so you'll see, you know, people like McKinsey have suddenly clicked on to, you know, the global management consultancy, have realized that design is a is a story and a service that they should be talking to their clients about so they set up a design team about i don't know three or four years ago had two people in to start in even in the london office alone it's got over 200 people now working and what you now find is chief design officers in corporations across every sector so design is seeping in to the economy as a whole. Um, London Design Festival is the preeminent design promotion activity in, in the UK. And uh, alongside the Binani, we've, gen we've built up from scratch the two most important events. So it, it is the place to tell those stories and to introduce your products, your thinking and your activity to 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 wider audiences 
So we consider it our responsibility to try to be at the forefront of, of, of all of those changes. So I'm going to have to stop in five minutes. I've got five minutes. That's okay. Yeah, no worries. I've got just got a couple of questions and we can wrap it after that. What design okay. trends do you foresee in the future, especially in global design context? Um, well, one of the things I haven't talked much about is, is kind of well-being. The, the, the jolt that triggered our interest here is the global pandemic. You know, we, we have realized we need to think about ourselves a little bit more and our, our health and our well-being, and I include our kind of mental well-being. And what role can design play in, in facilitating that? And we talked a bit about environment earlier, um, but there are more and more tools that um, either as kind of products or services that can help us cope with the challenges of 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 day-to-day -day life. Um, you know, particularly in over congested kind of uh, urban environments. You know, how do we how can we pause and think about ourselves and take care of ourselves and and others who are imp important to us. Um, and you know, picking up on this thread that design um, is seeping into our wells. Um, if it can address that need and some of the problems around our our well being, be it you know our 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 our, our, our physical environments, um, our uh, our domestic lives, our, you know um, our our work our work experiences, you know all of them are under great consideration at, at the moment. All right. So the final thing I'd like to ask you is that what what is a typical day in Ben Evans life? Does he watch cricket? Does he cook by himself? Does he watch football? Does he go out partying? What's a typical day in your life? I mean, for an Indian, you won't let me say this. I've got no interest in cricket. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I have a big interest in football. Um, I'm an Arsenal fan. And I'm a, the reason I'm an Arsenal fan because my dad was an Arsenal fan. Oh, was, yeah, I'm um, a Liverpool fan over here. Okay, and he's a deter he was determined that I would be an Arsenal fan, but also because I used to live near the ground, and uh, when I was a kid, I could be playing in a local park and I could hear a roar go up, which is when they'd scored a goal. Um, so that's been a kind of in, important part of my life. I'm married to an architect, so it means we live in a pretty amazing house that she designed. Um, and our lives are very much around um, um, entertaining and being entertained, uh, experiencing the, the 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 incredible array of cultural offer in London, um, eating great food in, or from everywhere in the world, um, and as, as I've got older and older, enjoying better and better wine. All right, Ben. It has been a really pleasure to have a conversation with you today. All right. Thanks very All much. Right. Thank you. It's been a pleasure talking to you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. I can hear you, but I can't see you. You cannot hey, see me. No. Oh, did you close your eyes? No, no, I didn't close my eyes. I'm able to see you. All right. <laughs> speaking i was not expecting to see you because i thought it you're like three minutes late i am not sure if i'm <laughs> sure or not i know I have, I have a habit of being just always late someone catches me and so i was scrambling to find the link and get set up so <laughs> and the other room is too noisy hang on let me just turn that light off one second that's better yeah it's better now so, how's your day going? It's afternoon here in India. How's the uh, weather in England at the moment? It's raining. <laughs> it's raining? Yeah, yeah. All right, then. It's, I'll just give you a brief introduction it, of who I am and what I do. I am... Right. You can just adjust the camera and whenever you want me to start, I can begin.